protecting uh, Greece from our shoreline. And what's happening in Greece is what may be in store for us if we don't collectively uh, buckle down and act responsibly. We're talking with Andrew Rohrbeck, who's running for the open 5th District Congressional seat. He's a Republican and a state senator. You can join us at 860-275-7266. Doug is calling from Plainville. Hi, Doug. Good morning, John. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Uh, I'm a conservative Republican. I voted for Senator Rohrbeck back in the primary, and, and I haven't liked what I've heard during the general election. And before I say, you know, I buy it from Lord, or I regret my decision, I wanted to give the senator an opportunity to tell you know, economic conservatives like me you know, that you're with us. How, how do you reassure us that you are, are with us on those important issues? Well, Doug, I, I would answer the question in this way. Uh, I don't think that raising taxes on January 1st is a good idea. Uh, my opponent embraces uh, the president's proposal to have a very big tax increase on January 1st. And, and again, this is the this is the tax increase that would that has to do with the Bush era tax uh, tax credits. And so, essentially, the the Obama position, the Democratic position, is that the t uh, the taxes on people two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and more would be would be uh, changed. Not those below two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Actually, I think it's uh, individuals at two hundred thousand, couples at two hundred fifty thousand. But understand that that fifty three percent of um, people in that category are people that own small businesses, LLCs, subchapter S corporations, who are making their money through a business. And the options they have are: Do I invest my profits in growing my business, in hiring new people, in expanding my plant, my equipment, or do I write a bigger check to the federal government? So, Doug, I would say there's one area where my opponent and I disagree. We also disagree about uh, whether or not the Keystone Pipeline would be a good thing for our country. Uh, my opponent says she's against it, even though she's raised $20,000 from the law firm that's representing the Keystone Pipeline in Washington. And I think that if we're going to have uh, economic recovery and energy security, uh, we need to take advantage of North American sources of supply. Uh, the third area where we disagree is on the health care plan. As I've said, uh, there are elements of the health care plan that I think are desirable, but there are other elements of it that I think are going to uh, have a real detrimental impact on us. Well, what, what, what are your concerns? Because I'm sure you do have some concerns about the source of the, of the, uh, the oil that's coming from, the, uh, from this pipeline, from the tar sands in Canada, the potential for environmental problems uh, north of us. Um, I, I'm wondering, as you've looked into this this issue, uh, how is that you've determined that this is indeed something that's going to going to work for America? That getting this fuel in this way is the right thing to do. Well, the question isn't whether or not this energy is going to be tapped. The energy will be tapped. The only question that's before us is where the energy will go. This is a seven uh, billion dollar project that will put thousands of people to work and that will put this country in a place where it can lessen its dependency on foreign sources of oil. The pipeline's either going to come south to Texas or go west to Vancouver. Uh, and I think um, that I was, I was against it when it was going to go over the largest aquifer in the Midwest. But now it's been rerouted to avoid the aquifer. And at the end of the day, if we don't have energy security, if we don't have uh, the peace of mind that we can um, sustain our appetite um, for energy, which is fueling our economic recovery, we're going to be more and more reliant on the Middle East. And I don't think that's a good thing. Now, I'm a conservative, and the first part of conservative is conserve. And I think part of the way uh, that we're going to achieve energy independence is by lessening our consumption of energy in dramatic ways. And we're doing a lot of that now. In Connecticut, I've been a big supporter of the work done by the Clean Energy Fund and the ability for us as homeowners to call and have our, our individual homes audited so we know where we're wasting energy. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, this pipeline um, is something that I think could help our economy and something that the president made a mistake in um, taking off track. I, I want to get to a quick call from Ben in Wallingford. Hi, Ben. Hi. Um, this is, my name's Ben. I'm a volunteer with 350 Connecticut, an organization that's uh, statewide. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, first of all, just in regards to the last comments by uh, the candidate that um, the tar the uh, Keystone XL would bring us, bring us energy security, it's just kind of ironic that he would say that when the reason for the pipeline is to get it to an export 
port in the Gulf of Mexico. And my second, my question would be something that we sent out to all the candidates, which we haven't got an answer from Andrew Warbach yet, is that do you support ending all fossil fuel subsidies for oil, coal, and natural gas, which would total $113 billion over the next decade? And specifically, would you support H.R. 5745, which is the End Polluter Welfare Act introduced by Representative Keith Ellison this year? Uh, thank you for your, your questions, uh, Ben. Andrew Orbach? Uh, thank you, Ben. On the first point, I well understand that the pipeline going to Texas will enable the energy that's coming out of Canada to be exported if that is, uh, you know, where the demand is. But I also understand that um, having that supply end up in the United States of America is something that all of us should take some comfort from because none of us know, with world events swirling around about us as they are, uh, I think we could all... Uh, take some comfort from knowing that a half a million barrels of oil a day are uh, flowing through this country and available to meet our needs in the case of an emergency. With respect to oil company subsidies and the like, my view is that rather than raising taxes um, kind of in an impulsive way, the entire tax code needs to be reformed. And the same approach that I take to solving Social Security and Medicare, that you ought to put people in a room who are willing to find common ground, uh, that have the courage to be independent, we ought to look at every tax loophole and determine whether or not it's continuing to serve whatever purpose it may have had when it was adopted. Is it continuing to serve its intended purpose? But so, if you're in that room, if you're one of the people chosen to be in that room, you've got to, you know, in order to bang that out, you've got to have some sort of a position. So the question is, well, okay. do you support subsidies for fossil fuel companies? So, I think what I need to have, John, uh, is information. Because before making any decision, I think everyone in that room needs to gather all of the relevant information. Now, um, I don't. Uh, I think that the, obviously uh, oil companies uh, appear to be uh, doing well, and they do. If, if taxpayers are subsidizing them, um, we need to look at the ways in which they may be subsidizing them, and uh, does it make sense? So I don't. Um, what I think all of us have an obligation to do in every case is to gather all information and to give everyone an opportunity to tell their side of the story um, and then make a decision. And I certainly think that if uh, taxpayers are underwriting um, profitable corporations, that's not something that we can afford to do any longer. Um, because of the nature of the deficits that we're facing. We're talking with Andrew Rohrabach. If you want to join us, 860-275-7266. He's a Republican. He's running for the 5th District Congressional seat. We're going to take one more break, and when we come back, we'll give you a chance to ask some more questions of the candidate here on the Where We Vote edition of Where We Live. There's one issue that's dominated the race between President Barack Obama and Republican challenger Mitt Romney. We don't build the economy from the top down. We build it from the bottom up. Let's get America working again. On Wednesday, the candidates will debate the economy and other domestic issues. I'm Guy Raz. Join us for special coverage of the first presidential debate from NPR News. Listen Wednesday night at 9 on WNPR and streaming live at WNPR.org. Funding comes from our members and from Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, connecting history to our life and times. This year marking the Emancipation Proclamation at 150. Still relevant, still revolutionary. Tours and programs year-round. Information at HarrietBeecherStowe.org. And from Graduate Liberal Studies at Wesleyan University offering a variety of fascinating graduate-level courses for adults seeking a degree or for personal enrichment. Open house on October 3rd, wesleyan.edu slash masters. WNPR's business desk is made possible by Bloom Shapiro. Listen for the business report 806 weekdays on Morning Edition. For more, go to wnpr.org, keyword business. It'll be mostly sunny today with temperatures around 71. Thanks for listening to WNPR, Connecticut's public radio station, and WNPR. Org. 
This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankowski. Coming up on tomorrow's show, ice in the Arctic Ocean is at a record-setting low this year, covering less of the sea, melting at a more rapid rate than ever. Warming waters changing things not just in the Arctic, but everywhere, and cities are trying to adapt. What will this all mean for the Northeast? You can find out on tomorrow's Where We Live. You can join the conversation always at WNPR.org. Keyword where. Today on the program, we're talking with Andrew Rohrbeck. He's a Republican state senator who is running for the 5th District Congressional seat against Elizabeth Esty coming up in November. She's been on our program. You can find that interview at WNPR.org, keyword where. We're taking your calls now at 860-275-7266. Let's go to a few folks here. Richard in Southbury. Hi, Richard. Yes, uh, g good morning. Uh, I'm uh, come out of the industry, and I've been working in, in, uh, in the past in environmental protection for some years, and uh, I, I agree that existing regulations may be too complex and, and are expensive, but I think the philosophy of deregulation at any cost, I believe, is quite sh short-sighted. Uh, and, for example, the Clean Air Act uh, um, puts considerable restrictions on electric utilities about how they burn coal in, in the, to generate electricity. Uh, but these same regulations have considerable effects, positive effects, on reducing th diseases such as lung cancer and, and other diseases, respiratory pro problems. Yes. So I'm, I'm afraid that uh, being too conservative, fiscally conservative, is just going to drive away and dismantle the regulations that are so important to our health and safety. R Richard, thank you very much. Andrew Rohrbeck? And, and Richard, I wouldn't want you to interpret my concern about the growing regulatory state as uh, dismantling all regulations. Uh, I understand. I, I happen to be a proponent of James Madison's view that government is a necessary good. And I've spent 18 years uh, trying to find balanced, reasonable uh, solutions where we weigh the costs and the benefits of any particular regulatory construct. So uh, don't have, I, 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 listen, I'm the ranking member on the Environment Committee in Hartford. I've been uh, recognized as an environmental hero by the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters. I'm not someone who isn't very attentive to uh, human health and the consequences of uh, the activities that we engage in on human health. What I'm saying is when I go to my local bank and they tell me that they are swamped with regulations that really don't protect the interests of anyone. All they do is burden the ability of a local institution that's been serving my community for a long time to do what they want to do, which is to lend money to small businesses, to help people uh, get into their homes. We have gone too far, in my view, in regulations, as I said, the tomato uh, that you can't use at a local restaurant because the Department of Public Health uh, has a regulation that, in my view, goes too far. I want to get to some more phone calls here. We'll go through some of them quickly. Greg's in West Hartford. Greg, can you hear me? Yes, hi. How are you? Go ahead. You're on the radio. Thanks for taking my call. I had a question for the senator in that uh, we talked about the influence of private money, and I heard his uh, diatribe about how people should get along and compromise things like it. But you look at agreements or uh, court decisions like People's United, where the influence of private money really seems to get in the way now. And thanks to private United, uh, I mean, People's United has gotten a lot worse. So someone like Grover Norquist can go and say, you know what, I'm going to make all the Republicans sign this uh, agreement where no taxes are going to be increased no matter what. And now their hands are tied. And it's not even the Republicans or the Democrats' fault. It's private money was tied them down. I mean, has the senator signed or will he sign the Grover Norquist promise? Uh, thank you. I think you're talking about Citizens United, Greg, but... Uh... To yeah, let, let me first, uh, Greg, uh, your point is very well taken, and I have not signed Grover Norquist Pledge, and I will not sign Grover Norquist Pledge, not because I want to raise taxes. I think, as I've said previously, it's not the right time for us to be raising taxes when we're trying to jumpstart this economy. The way we're going to raise revenue is by having more people working by growing the economy, and I think tax increases on those that are in the best position to create jobs uh, is the wrong public policy. And with respect to Citizens United, I don't think corporations are persons. And I certainly would support any effort to make sure that corporations and unions, quite frankly, can't be fueling uh, political uh, debate to the degree that they are. And I will say that one of the things that's concerned me, and I've called my opponent, at the, the Center for Responsive Politics in Washington, D.C., has observed that it doesn't look very good when my opponent is raising thousands of dollars from businesses and industries that her husband's agency directly regulates. 
Uh, my opponent's husband is in a position to help or to hurt hundreds of businesses in Connecticut. And those very businesses, people that generate power uh, with a lot of emissions going into the air, uh, people, manufacturers that need discharge permits, those very industries that could benefit or be hurt by actions taken by the agency my opponent's husband uh, regulates are fueling her campaign with lots of contributions. So she, she so says she said on my show that she, she's vetted these very closely. I, I think one other thing that people might might suggest is the nature of politics is that people who are running for office are taking money from people whose votes they may influence in some way. Certainly over the course of time with the many years in the state Senate, you've probably taken money from some folks who might have some sort of interest in the work that you're doing. That's the nature of the business, isn't it? Well, uh, uh, first of all, I think if you look in the state Senate, I've never taken a contribution to the best of my knowledge from a lobbyist or a PAC. Uh, I've always relied on contributions from individuals. But um, who are business owners and who are who are working in your district? No, but, yeah. but what's different here is that my opponent's husband occupies a station in which he's making a lot of decisions that have, it's not part of a legislative body, it's heading an agency that has enormous responsibility and enormous power. But is it fair and, to say that Elizabeth Esty is not her husband? Uh, pardon? Yeah, but, uh, you know, of course it's fair to say, but I'm telling you what the Center for Responsive Politics has <laughs> said is that it can create an impression. And, and I will tell you that I'm handicapped in my fundraising efforts because people that because I'm a sitting state senator, and I'll be a sitting state senator until January, there are lots and lots of people in the financial service industry who are prohibited by pay-to-play rules from contributing to my campaign. Why? Because the theory is I could influence the Connecticut State Treasurer and how she invests her pension funds. So people can't contribute to my <coughs> campaign because of a very tenuous notion that I could influence <coughs> our state treasurer, whereas people can contribute to my opponent very generously from a much less tenuous notion that she and her husband might talk about who's giving her money and what companies he's regulating. Uh, we just have a very little bit of time left. John in New Haven, very quickly, if you would. Hi. Yeah, I have a question for the senator. Uh, I'm a moderate Republican, and I was wondering if, if, if elected, would Senator Warbeck partner with the other Republicans and kind of blame entitlement spending as the only way to reduce the deficit or look for other ways to cut federal spending, let's say, like military spending. We look into that to help, you know, cut the deficit off. And, Good. and thank you, John. I appreciate it. Go ahead. John, I'm a moderate Republican, too, and I've never run from my political stripe. On fiscal issues, I'm pretty conservative. On social issues, I'm pretty moderate. But to answer your question, you know, the problem that we face is huge. And, the, and my experience in Hartford has been as follows. The first thing you need to do is the hardest thing to do. And that's to reduce spending. And we never really got around to that in Hartford. You know, our budgets keep growing despite the economy being uh, in very rough shape. So what I've learned in Hartford is how not to solve the problem. In Washington, D.C., I think all of us, Republicans and Democrats, need to identify areas where we can reduce spending, knowing that it's going to hurt. Last year, federal tax revenues were 14% of GDP, and federal expenditures were 25% of GDP. We, we have to bring the spending down, and that has to happen before there's any discussions about how else to solve the problem. Because we're just 30 seconds left, would that mean that you would support cuts to military spending? Well, I, what I would look to is leaders in the military to tell us, are there ways they can do their job more efficiently? I will not support any cuts in military spending that compromise our national security. Now, sequestration is another conversation we could have, uh, but I don't think, I think we have to be very, um, we have to use the scalpel and work in consultation with our generals, our military leaders, to make sure we don't compromise our security as a and, people. And we will have to leave it there with Andrew Rohrbeck. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening, and thanks to your listeners uh, for their attention to this very important election. And now, a bird note moment. If birding destinations on the continent were put to a vote, Cape May, New Jersey would without question fly among...